This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. He was a showman, a barnstormer, a man crowned world champion on three continents. He was an innovator, a scientific curiosity, a physical specimen deemed worthy of study and emulation. He was a Canadian, celebrated for his unyielding defense of American virtue. A black man, elevated to unprecedented heights by white society. For a decade leading into the twentieth century, few black men were as wealthy, and none were more famous. Above all, George Dixon was a flawless fighter, a self-taught genius whose peerless exploits in the ring inspired a previously unseen pride among black America that often spilled into city streets across the country. He fought constantly as a professional, maybe against a thousand opponents in his lifetime. While most were exhibitions against rather faceless foes, a hundred or so of those bouts were chronicled by both black and white presses. A half-dozen came to define an era. His championship reign ushered in an embrace of black athletes at the highest echelons of sport. To a black culture cementing its first national heroes, George Dixon was the single most significant athlete of 19th century America. In June 1892, Dixon's defeat of British featherweight champion Fred Johnson was seen as a stirring victory for the United States, a moment of national revelry led by a young black man. None other than John L. Sullivan, heavyweight champion of the world and a boastful racist, leaped to his feet at fight's end to shout, Good for Boston and the United States. This was an America only a generation removed from black slaves being bought, sold, and consumed for the gain of white men. Now a black man was asserting his manhood by way of sport, beating white men with his near bare hands, rising to heights higher than any man his size, no matter what color. It was a delicious irony not lost on black America. Among the coast-to-coast -coast accolades, the New Orleans Crusader wrote perhaps the most powerful words about a black athlete standing in Jim Crow America. If he handled a Winchester as well as he does his fists, Regulators would be scarce and lynchings rare occurrences. Hard to imagine the weight of that burden laid upon young shoulders. But George Dixon was a complicated man, with a complicated legacy. Beyond the cheering crowds, he was a drunk, a gambler, an incompetent spendthrift businessman who lost fortunes with spectacular ease. He was a puppet, a sucker, a willing captive of numerous unscrupulous white men. In public, he was prone to violent outbursts and fits of rage. In private, he was beholden to his own dark vices. For a decade after his entry into the twentieth century, few black men were as pitied, and none named more frequently from public square and pulpit as a cautionary tale of modern excesses. He tried to live the part of a sporting man while knowing his place as a black man in a white world, all with little guidance and opportunists at every turn. Dixon was also a man who could be indifferent to his race. Never the activist, he neither drew race lines of his own nor punished clubs that encouraged them. He fought anyone, anywhere, for a paycheck. There were sympathies for fellow blacks, certainly. You see them in the small stories of his interactions with individuals. But his hand was equally open to whites. He was a generous soul. Yet those stories do not overtake the overwhelming indifference Dixon had to face when it came to his life's work. In the ring, he was a hero to the black man. But it is difficult to portray him among revolutionary race leaders of his time. He lived in a white world rather contentedly, with white managers and associates, as so many black boxers had, and also a white wife, the sister of his most powerful and influential manager. 
he was comfortable in his confinement. Yes, he challenged Jim Crow when his drunken temper took over, but Dixon...